Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, Oscars, Banksy and Reading with the Lights Off. For movie buffs, all eyes are on who the Academy gave a nomination to. An anonymous artist with a genius mind in a new show in Germany. And this bookshop in Taiwan invites you to the dark side. In the past year, the coronavirus pandemic blocked audiences from theatres. But despite that, the Oscars season has begun full throttle. And it seems like the race is going to be among a handful of acclaimed heavyweights. Mank, it's Orson Welles. Mank, director David Fincher's commentary on Hollywood politics, already became the jagger not to beat, with 10 Oscar nominations. The black and white period picture had previously returned empty handed from the controversial 78th edition of the Golden Globes. Just call me Ahab. Do come in. At this rate, you will never finish. You said 90 days. Well, said 60. I'm doing the best I can. You are one of those lucky people that can travel anywhere. Yes, ma'am. And they sometimes call you. Nomads. Another movie that looks like a red-hot favorite at this year's Oscars is Nomadland. Chloe Zhao's epic drama landed six nominations including Best Director. Earlier this month, the Chinese filmmakers sweeped the Golden Globes, taking home awards for directing and Best Drama. You want to consider early retirement. I need work. I like work. My assistant tells me that you're interested in resuming med school. I left under unusual circumstances. This year, the Oscars for the first time have two women filmmakers going up for the directing award. He took a girl. And Chloe Zhao's competition is Emerald Fennell, who helped the acclaimed thriller Promising Young Woman. Previously, Fennell was awarded Best Writing and Director Honors by the Alliance of Women Film Journalists. For the foreign film category, Lee Isaac Chung's autobiographical Minari is considered the title to beat. We need to find water somewhere. If you get soil ain't wet, you're going to lose a crop. It will be in competition against the TRT co-produced war drama Kuo Wadis Ida. We still have to wait a little longer to find out who'll get a statuette due to a delay of pandemic proportions. But the envelopes will be opened and we'll find out who the winner is on April 25th. <laughs> Well, who else were we going to talk to besides film critic Ali Arukan? Hi there, good to have you back on the Showcase couch. <laughs> Absolutely, so, great to be here. Meng. My favorite couch ever. <laughs> of course it is. Okay, so uh, Meng, I think uh, it, it has tremendous buzz at the moment, but I wonder uh, what you think about it. Do you think it will finally turn things around after the Golden Globe uh, nomination you know, issue? <laughs> I mean... Look, um, this is something that we were talking about earlier anyway, and, 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 um, and I'll you know, want to mention it now. I don't think anyone is really that excited, except for people who are nominated for an Oscar, because, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it becomes the first line of your obituary if you win one. But except for the people who are nominated for an Oscar, are you excited? I mean, the whole world is talking about it. Well, they can talk about it because I'm, I'm not, I'm like, I'm definitely not, ex I'm not excited about Mank. Um, okay. You know what I was Tell more me. excited about? You know what I was more excited about? I was more excited about the positive reviews for the four hour cut of Justice League, Snyder Cut. Um, okay. I was more, yeah, absolutely. You know, they, 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 shot a whole scene with Batman and Joker. That's, that's more interesting to me right now than, than, this, than the Mank or uh, Nomadland, which I definitely did not like. Um, Chicago 7, just whatever. Okay, which one is worse, Nomadland or Mank? 
I don't know. I think they're, they're equal in their crapulence. Um, okay. The, the um, Nomadland is... I, I didn't particularly care for Nomadland for one, uh, uh, one reason, at least one reason, because it's... It, 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 I don't want to say it's, you know, poverty porn, but there is definitely that aspect to it. But what it is, is you have these people who are either uh, amateurs or uh, uh, playing fictionalized versions of themselves and whatever. And then you, <laughs> you've got Francis McDormand, two-time Oscar winner, and David Strathen acting, you know? And it's just like, <laughs> the, 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 there, there is this disconnect in the, in, in the way that the film is presented. And it's just, the, the, uh, it's just boring. Um, uh, so that was that. Uh, Mank, uh, it's, it's, it's a four, I mean, it's like, like you remember we talked about Mank, I think, uh, when it first came yeah. out. It was like, so it's like, you know, 60% true. I, 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 who cares whether it's true or not? But, um, you know, 60%, but 40% just absolutely flagrantly um, untrue. So, um, and apart from that, I, I also think that Mank is, uh, has other problems going with it. Okay. What movies would you want to see in the Oscar nominations list this year then? What would I, um, well, another round was great. I mean, it got a, a best um, uh, 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 foreign, best film in foreign language, whatever, you know, I have to find the exact wording for it, whatever. <laughs> uh, best film in non-English language, whatever, you know, the foreign film. And uh, so uh, uh, that was great, which is... Um, uh, you know, like I said, when I first saw it, I said, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a great Larry Miller bit from the uh, late 1980s, uh, early 1990s called Five Levels of Drinking. And this, is, this film is basically that, Five Levels of Drinking, the movie. Um, um, I thought an another round was great. I thought Ma Rainey's Black Bottom was fantastic. Um, uh, absolutely, you know, like brilliant. Um, I thought First Cow was great. And there was a time, I mean, you know, no Kelly... Because this is a, a, a sort of a different year, everyone thought that maybe Kelly Reichardt's First Cow could possibly get a nomination. It didn't, but I thought that was the best film of the year. Absolutely fantastic. So there were some really good films. It's just that there are two things. First, you know, the world being what it is right now. Okay. Um, you know, the Oscars are probably like, you know, of the least amount of concern for anyone, film critic or non-film critic alike. Uh, and secondly, I think just the nominees are like, nah, yeah, all right. Okay, the world being what it is right now, releasing schedules were kind of complicated. Yeah. How do you think this affected the nominations? Well, uh, it, it, well, it affected in the way that, um, I think generally speaking, here's, a, here's where the major effect came in. People say that um, films uh, and how much they make in the box office is not important to, you know, to the quality of a film, which is true to a certain extent, maybe, um, or, or being nominated um, uh, for an Oscar. Uh, on the contrary, you know, it, it, it is very important. You know, you, you, people, are, they're not going to, this is, a, this is a very much like a business Hollywood the film business showbiz award. Uh, they're not going to nominate flops. However, now, um, because we can't really gauge what was a genuine success and what wasn't, um, so you have all these films and uh, a lot of these films that otherwise would not have mm -hmm. been nominated, I don't think, got a nomination. I don't think Chicago... Well, I'm... Uh, <laughs> Okay. Being what it is, uh, I, I'm a, I like Sorkin very much. I, and in fact, when I first saw the film, I was like, yeah, all right. And then the second time I was going, oh, you know, and um, <laughs> sorry, but it was like that. <laughs> and uh, you can't watch it a second time. And um, uh, that would have been nominated. But I don't think, for example, The Father would have been nominated. 
Mm-hmm. But who has seen the father? It's like the Mauritanian, like Jodie Foster winning an Oscar for a, a Golden Globe for the Mauritanian. You know, I'd rather live in Mauritania than watch that movie. <laughs> All right. I'm sure Mauritania is great, by the way. But you no. know. All right, we get your point, Ali. Thank you. So, do you think? I mean, obviously, it's one of the most, probably the most diverse uh, nominations list uh, ever. Are you excited because of that? Well, you know, diverse. <laughs> Mm. Hashtag <laughs> diversity matters. Of course, diversity matters. Of course, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited for that. And, I'm, I, and you know, I, I sound a bit glib now saying, you know, mm-hmm. it is very important. And I think that the, the fact that they changed the makeup of the academy uh, and, um, and, and thus introduced a whole bunch of people uh, who, who were otherwise, um, whose voices were otherwise unheard, um, it is very important. <sighs> Minari, for example, mm-hmm. that's a great film, and and that's you know that's that's definitely a showcase for diversity, open the Sundance, whatever, Korean American experience, and uh, wonderful film, absolutely wonderful. But um, when it comes to s- certain other stuff, um, I don't quite think it's because of the diversity uh, mm-hmm. or the diversity effort. I think. So something like um, uh, um, Judas and the Black Messiah, which uh, is powerful uh, in, in moments and strident in others. So I, mm-hmm. I was kind of you know, kind of in the middle uh, with that one. Um, maybe that wouldn't have been nominated normally. Uh, uh, normally. But you know, but normally one night in Miami would have been nominated because you've got all these you've got these four you know incredibly important black icons in one room on one night just talking mm-hmm. about the black struggle that would have been nominated because the white people nominating it would have felt very good about themselves. So I don't know. I mean, it's 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 a it's a fine line. We still have to wait. Okay, Ali Arkan, it was lovely having you on our set today. Thanks a lot. Lovely to be here again. Thank you. Thank you. Banksy may be from the UK, but the biggest collection of the anonymous street artist's work is in Munich, all thanks to a superfan. Check it out. Banksy's art is not always accessible. It gets removed by property owners or the state and other times it's just shredding at auction. But a fan in Germany is bringing together an extensive collection of one of the most established anonymous art figure. It's called the Mystery of Banksy, a genius mind. So we have around more than uh, 100 uh, artworks that that involve installations, prints, um, sculpture, mapping. So the whole idea that we have it is just create a whole experience to you to understand the whole job of Banksy. So the most important thing is like you come over here and discover how Banksy developed all the speech around like the whole career that he had. The show features a selection of available prints and reproduced installations such as this one titled If you don't mask, you don't get it. That one was painted inside a London underground train last July. By the time the artist's Instagram account unveiled the work, cleaners had wiped it away. For me, it was like a very cool moment that he making Corona in the underground of the UK. And I think just a few persons can see this. In the moment that they notice that someone's just make a graffiti and over there, they change the wagon. So we try to make a reproduction of that moment, of that experience, to give it the chance to the people to immerse in that uh, situation and see how it works. Also, we have like the video in the way that he made it. And we make our best uh, work and effort to make like reproductions more similar from the that the spectators have the interactive of this piece. And there is a fairly even mix of some of Banksy's world famous and lesser known works. Those include Girl with Balloon and an original painting of the work which was shredded. Banksy is one of the most provocative stunt performers in the art world today and the show's curator believes that the artist's efforts are not in vain. I really think like the whole message about Banksy is like 
you, we need to be more humans. This society right now is a very weird for me. So we are in the cutting edge moment, like, like humanity, we can see all the changes and all the bad things that we made it. And I think Banksy is the best way to reflect, make a reflection about this and thinking about it. And it seems the show's creators have thought about the lessons we could take away from Banksy. The artist is not connected to the show, so how can they use Banksy's art? Well, they use the artist's own stated principle about copyright, that copyright is for losers. Russia's exploring whether or not millennial art could be considered as a new surge in the Russian avant-garde movement. So, a new exhibition allows Gen Y artists, who are roughly in their 30s, express themselves. Nursen Altutar has more. The State Russian Museum in St. Petersburg gives the floor to the millennial artists. The exhibition, Generation of 30-Year-Olds in Contemporary Russian Art, showcases more than 100 works by 40 local millennials. Our childhood took place at the turn of the eras, and this gave us the opportunity to feel the taste of freedom and understand that everything can be looked at from different points of view. And this opportunity to analyze what's going on from one and then another side, and still another side, this is perhaps what distinguishes our generation. The exhibition is arranged in three sections. Dialogue with material experiments with different forms. Inside yourself could be regarded as the most millennial section, as it's all about self-reflections and dealing with anxieties. The theme self-awareness has seen its high time within the millennial generation. The third and final section is called Habitat, and this is about technology and how it evolved over the years. We are probably the last generation which knows life before and after smartphones. They often have a rather detrimental effect on us because many artists that we present talk about personal addiction to social media. Their works either directly relate to this theme or non-directly being born on this basis of permanent transition from online to offline and back. This exhibition is said to be an attempt to talk more about the millennial artists' individual experiences, fears, traumas or fantasy worlds. The artist Lara Nibiru says, although her generation's art has depressive undertones, she still finds beauty in the trash heap. It can be hard to find a quiet place to read, whether it be at a park, a bus or even in bed. But now there is a place with almost no distractions. Where exactly? Well, we don't want to keep you in the dark, but for this experience, we kind of have to. No, this is not a nightclub or some sort of experimental exhibition. It's a bookshop in southern Taiwan. But why does it have to be so dark? Well, according to the designer of the Wuguan bookstore, they wanted to make the space disappear and encourage visitors to focus on what really matters. When the space is dark and the light is dim, it's like when you read late at night. These dim lights draw near the distance between the visitor and the book. It's a very spiritual connection between people and books. It's not like trying to find something in a commercial space. You can quickly feel the content of the book. And to make the most of this dreamy world of books, one must better understand the shop's slogan, which is Wuguan Books, about soul reading. Many people wonder why it's called soul reading. This is because we believe everyone has a soul, and this is the truth aspect of the person. Because maybe you will not show the deepest part of the soul to others, but it exists in the body and will always be there. We hope that when people walk in this bookstore, 
they'll free their soul, free the truth part of them. This is also in line with the entrance of the store, which mimics a traditional Chinese morning shrine. But before one gives into the darkness, one must fully understand what they're getting into. First of all, you have to be over 18 and pay an entrance fee of around $4. And there's no cheating. You can't use your smartphone to light the way. Also, if someone happens to step on your toes, the store advises you to get even, instead of shouting and ruining the vibe. But for one visitor, the experience was a bit challenging. At first, when I walked in, I felt scared because it was quite dark. The feeling is different from usual. I also panicked because I couldn't see. I guess it was a natural reflex. But the overall reading experience in the bookstore was comfortable. Well, it certainly is a shot in the dark. But since bookworms are used to getting lost in different worlds while reading, it probably won't be hard for them to adapt to this dark world of books. After more than 30 years, Prince Akeem is once again coming to America. But for many critics, Eddie Murphy didn't strike comedic gold. Hey! What are you doing back here? You awesome. right in this I've just discovered that I may have a son here in this land. How much child support is she getting from? The king pays no child support. Eddie Murphy's Prince Akeem first came to America to ditch his pre-arranged marriage and find true love. The film was a global hit, making it Paramount Pictures' highest grossing production in 1988. Now, Akeem returns to Queens, New York, to find his illegitimate son and apparent heir to the throne. That's despite having a daughter who's been groomed for the position all her life. King Akeem's son from America. The massive cast includes countless cameos from the original movie, big list celebrities, old school musicians, and current day rappers. Even the original writers came back to produce the script, but director John Landis did not. Craig Groover replaces him after previously directing Murphy in 2019's acclaimed biopic, Dolomite is My Name. Would you dare banish me from my own bedroom? <laughs> but despite its highly anticipated status, the film divided critics. Variety says it uses the same amusing elements from the original, but points out that they don't play the same way in the context of this sequel. Empire magazine takes issue with Eddie Murphy getting sidelined in his own movie but concludes by saying that the sequel is a serviceable return to the fictional country of Zamunda. And Salen believes the film to be a worthy successor that skewers outdated patriarchal traditions. In the end, Coming to America 2 has been likened to a loving family reunion and will satisfy fans bent on nostalgia. They're going to sharpen you too, nephew. <laughs> it's been more than a year since many music, movie and art venues moved online. Now certain artistic spaces are letting people slowly back in. And for some gallery owners in Berlin, it's about time. Claudia Maria Frank reads the classic German fairy tale, Heart of Stone. The actor performs in a venue which stages small concerts, art exhibitions, and theater shows. It's normally full of audiences, but now she's performing in front of a camera, and only one other person is there to help her. This is what a digital cultural event looks like. For almost a year, Frank was only able to make shows online, and she says the experience has been terrible. Like someone pulled the rug out from under, so completely unexpectedly. I've thought about whether I should be a train driver or a kindergarten teacher, but neither has worked out so far, unfortunately. I'm serious, because I don't see that in the foreseeable future, things will get better. 
Gallery Hibike and Probst opened in January 2020 with great hopes for the future. However, it closed after only two months. With the coronavirus pandemic, it quickly switched to an online version. However, flawless logistics haven't led to a product people are flocking to. This field complete. It's totally missing. What can we say? Sure, you can do all sorts of things, but it's not enough. When people are interested and we ask them to have a look virtually, they always say they want to see the original. What can we say then? And really, art has a lot to do with meeting people. Although music venues and theaters remain closed, galleries in Berlin started welcoming a small number of guests at pre-booked time slots. And for gallery owners like Hiliki, it gives hope that people hungry for cultural events will start walking through her doors once again. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Berekitli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.